another name that's really come, come hot on the scene is Josh Giddy from Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's rumors that he can go as high to as seven to Golden State. We have a very special guest, uh, NBA draft analyst from basketballnews.com, Matt Babcock. How are you? Hey, Brian, I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, before we get underway, can you let our listeners know where they can find you on Twitter and where they can find your work? Sure, yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Matt Babcock11. Uh, and then uh, all of my content can be found at basketballnews.com. Great. Yeah. So I've been following along. You've, you've been pumping out some great stuff there. Um, and I just want to kind of pick your brain about, you know, it seems like there's a pretty clear top four with Cade Cunningham, Jalen Green, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs. You have them in your latest mock draft in the order that I think most people do with this, you know, Cade to the Pistons, Jalen to the Jalen Green to the Rockets, Mobley to the Cavs, Jalen Suggs to the Raptors. So it seems like the real intrigue starts at number five with the Magic, barring any trades. Um, who are some of the guys in that mid to late lottery range that you're particularly high on? Well, uh, I mean, first of all, to address the, the top four picks, I, I do have those guys set there. I, I do think there's a lot of uh, discussions behind the scenes about teams moving around and moving up. Uh, Evan Mobley seems like a guy a few teams might be interested in moving up to the top two or three to get. Um, mm -hmm. So just just to kind of preface all that, we're expecting there to be potential movement, uh, you know, draft night. Uh, in, in regards to like mid, late lottery, uh, we've been high on James Booknight all year, and it's nice to see him kind of you know come come around from a uh, media standpoint and uh, kind of come in line with what what we felt about him throughout the year. And uh, we're expecting him to go number six to OKC. Uh, another name that's really come come hot on the scene is Josh Giddy from Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's rumors that he can go as high to as seven to Golden State. Okay. Uh, and the one guy that's really really kind of thrown a wrench in things is Jonathan Kaminga. We we had him. Uh, pretty much is like the fifth, I think, fifth guy for most of the year. And he seems to potentially be a guy that could slip a little bit. And uh, we're trying to figure out where, where he can go. Is it seven? Is it eight? Um, you know, for me, he's he's a talented enough kid. You know, he gets the, those points. You got to look at him whether he fits or not. Uh, so we've got we've got an interesting draft draft night coming. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about Kaminga in particular, because as you mentioned, it felt like for most of the year, at least early in the year, the conversations were like, we had a big five, not just a big four in this draft. And Kaminga was the number five guy. It seemed like him and Suggs, him and Green were all, it was like Cade and then Mobley and then these three guys. And it, it just based on a lot of the conversations happening, it does seem like Kaminga has slipped a bit, you know, in terms of perception, at least he has fallen into that next tier down. So what do you think is driving, you know, some of that potential slippage? Yeah, I mean, some of the negative intel that I've heard, I'm not saying it's necessarily true or right, uh, but things of, you know, whispers that he might be a little bit older, um, you know, teams didn't like how he bailed on the on the G League team, um, you know, just some, some concerns with his uh, his approach. I mean, is he is he a winner? You know, stuff like that. I, I personally don't think the negative intel adds up. I think it's being blown out of proportion. I, I really like Jonathan. I, I had an opportunity to spend uh, three, four days with him in Florida and watched him work out and got to know him and really enjoyed being around him and, and loved his work ethic and intensity in his workouts. And, and his, his, his talent's, you know, undeniable. I mean, from a physical standpoint, uh, he's so athletic and, uh, you know, just physically imposing as, as a big wing. And I think he's got a lot of potential as a finisher and, and shooter. Um, and so I, I, I do really like him. I, I hope he doesn't slip too far because I, I don't think he should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, right now in your latest mock, you have Scar Scotty Barnes going fifth to the Magic and then Kuminga going eighth, which I feel like is probably their pretty much their best case scenario, right? I would think so. Um, I mean, I, you know, there's a little little bit of, of overlap there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I mean, Scotty Barnes was used as a point guard at Florida State this year. I see him more as a point forward guy that's going to play more of the 3-4, which is similar to Kuminga, even though they're different styles, uh, you know, style of players. So... You know, it, it, there could be an argument they need to get two guys that are, are a little bit more different from each other. If it were me, I wouldn't overanalyze it. I would take both of them. But, uh, you know, it's not my choice. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned some potential trade ups, and I feel like the Magic probably in that conversation because they have five and eight. The Warriors have been mentioned really all year now that they have, you know, seven, 14 Wiseman who they can dangle. Um, who do you think some of these other teams are that could be trying to push up into the top four, whether it's for Mobley, Green, or Suggs? 
Um, I mean, I know, I know Toronto. Uh, well, at least the word is that Toronto really wanted Evan Mobley, and that they were really disappointed when when they got four. Uh, so I could see them being a team that that's talking with Cleveland or Houston as far as moving up to get him. Um, it sounds like Josh Giddy is a hot commodity, uh, and teams are, are calling around trying to move up for him. I've heard uh, Houston, Memphis. I've heard the Lakers like him. Um, J- Josh Giddy is really, really an interesting guy for this year's draft because I mean, you know, throughout the whole year he kind of chipped away at everybody and, and gradually moved up, and it seems like he's peaking at the right time. I mean, it's it sounded like he he might not even get out of the top ten. Um, yeah. And then uh, Chris Duarte is another guy, a, a guy that we were really high up on early in the year. Um, he's got a lot of love too, and uh, the rumor was the Lakers guaranteed him at 22. I, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but it does seem like there's a number of teams that that really like him. And I, and I think his his value is, is as far as being a guy that could step in and play right away. I think teams are, are valuing that maybe more than, than they have in, in the past. Um, and so he's a guy I, I, I think he could go possibly late lottery, too. Wow. Yeah, you have him mocked right now to the Warriors at 14, which if they don't trade those picks, you know, makes sense. They, they're probably in more of a win now window and need guys who can step in right away. They said at the end of the season, you know, we we don't have time to wait for any more developmental prospects. Uh, you mentioned Giddy, and I want to ask about him because I think, you know, a lot of people listening watch college basketball, watch the NBA, don't necessarily pay as much attention to all the international leagues. So can you just give an overview of, you know, what what is Josh Giddy heading into the NBA? What makes him worth a potential top 10 pick? Sure. Yeah. So he's he's, uh, he's an Australian player. P- played in the Australian league this year, the NBL. Uh, same league that Lamelo Ball came from uh, last year. Uh, and he's a big big point guard like Lamelo Ball. I mean, he's six seven, six eight, uh, ambidextrous, can make you know high level reads and passes with both hands. Uh, I think long term he could you know the, his versatility is is incredible. He can play the one, two, three. Um, you know, so he's just you know he's an 18 year old kid that's got a lot of upside. Uh, so and you know a guy that can play multiple positions. You can plug him into pretty much any team, and I think that's why so many teams are, are hot on him because of the upside, uh, but also the versatility. And so we're 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 pretty excited about him as well. Yeah, it, it seems like that's a pretty easy sell. You have him mocked to the Spurs right now. Lord knows they love their international players, and I could easily see him being a good fit there. Um, right, which which you know we're about to we're about to update this mock draft. I mean, for example, we've got Davion Mitchell at seven right now. I, I do not think that is happening anymore. Um, oh, I think okay. I think he's out of the mix for that pick. I got to figure out what to do at seven. Is it going to be Kaminga or Giddy? That's that's sort of what I'm what I'm, I'm uh, deciding from right now as far as what I think they're going to do. And another thing with our mock draft, I like to point out is throughout the year we, we make our own picks as far as put our, ourselves in, in the shoes of the GM of each team. And then the last couple weeks before the draft, we kind of switch gears and go a little bit more reporting and trying to project exactly what we think the teams will do. Uh, so we're in that mode right now as far as trying to project the picks. Gotcha. Okay. So talk to me about Davian Mitchell because I feel like I've heard a lot about these top six guys and now Book Knight as well seems to be gaining some steam. I haven't heard as much about Mitchell. Just it, it seems like he's one of these guys where he's a little bit older and it's you know kind of in the Chris, Chris Duarte mode where it's just we think this guy can come in and play right away even though he might not have the ceiling of a Kaminga or something like that. Well, I think there's two ways of looking at Davion Mitchell. If you're looking at it from a glass half full, he's a kid that's continually gotten better every every part of his game, offensively, defensively, and he's ready ready to play. And he's uh, he's pr- he's a proven winner. So I mean, he's going to be a high level defender that could pick up full court, just a bully of a, of a guard, um, and and he's really turned himself into a shot maker uh, off the dribble, off the catch, uh, and, and become a high level playmaker as well. If you're you know looking glass half empty. He was on the smaller side. He measured about six feet. Uh, you know, he's older. Um, you know, how much upside is there? And so I think uh, depending on how you're looking at him uh, could determine, you know, how, how much you value him. Uh, and so I, and, and it's interesting, like looking at, you know, half this draft or it's not even half, but some of the draft are guys like Davion Mitchell and Chris Duarte who are a little bit older that are ready to go. And you got so many guys that are, that are you know, the, with so much uncertainty as far as how they're going to develop, but they have a lot of upside. And so I think a lot of teams are going to be faced with that question of like, hey, do we want somebody that, you know, it's a sure thing that we know what we're getting, or do we want to swing for the fences and take one of these freshmen that had, you know, an up and down year that, you know, really, we really have a small sample size of them playing well. Uh, and so Mitchell kind of falls in that bone. It sounds like, you know, I, I don't see him slipping too much. I don't think he's going to go as high as seven, though. Okay. So I want to ask about that because, you know, especially 
Matisse, you know, I'm a Sixers guy, so like Matisse Thibel comes to mind as someone who slipped probably further than he should have because of his age, even though you knew this kid was going to be, you know, the age and offensive questions, but you knew what he brought defensively was going to be special. Do you think seeing what he's become in the NBA might swing the pendulum back a little bit toward, you know, we're not going to reach on these mystery box guys. We want that safety of at least this guy is not going to be a total bust. You know, I think it's case by case. I think one thing that, that people lose sight of, um, you know, with young guys or or mature players, all these guys need a good opportunity to thrive, right? And so I think Matisse is a perfect example. I, I, I've i loved Matisse for years. I, you know, I live in Colorado, so I'm in, in Pac-12 territory, and um, I, I got ahead on him. Same as Duarte, right? Um, and so I saw it with Matisse early, and he's a guy, they put him in a spot, and he was able to do his thing. If he hadn't got that opportunity, would have he have thrived as much? And the same could be said about a guy like Emmanuel Quickly. He goes to New York, they start him, he's getting shots. And then on the flip side, guys that you know, Obi Toppin never really got a chance in New York, you know. And so um, I think it really just depends on on the player and, and the situation they find themselves in. Gotcha. So it seems like I, you know I follow a lot of like Pelicans fans, especially, and right now it is the what the mock that's currently up. You have Moses Moody at ten, and it seems like everyone loves the archetype that Moses Moody is. But again, he's a guy who I just haven't heard as much about as some of these other you know, higher ranked prospects. So, you know, what what's appealing about Moses Moody? And do you think teams are valuing him properly or like <laughs> given his archetype, do you think he's low, lower than he should be going? You know, Moses had a, a really good freshman year, you know, start to finish um, or, or for the most part. It, uh, you know, he's 6'5", he's 6'6", six, 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 really long wingspan and just a shot maker. Uh, and he's good defensively. He's not overly athletic, doesn't have, you know, a quick twitch type type athleticism to him. Um, and, and I think one thing that really has held him back a little bit is he really struggled in the tournament. Uh, and so I think some people kind of got turned off by him there. Um, seems like, you know, dust has set a little bit and people kind of forgot about that. Some. Uh, <laughs> and so he's a guy, you know, we've had him, I think, somewhere late lottery, uh, mid first all year. And, and he's a guy, even though he's a you know true freshman and a one and done, I think there's safety with him because he's going to be a guy that's going to be a capable defender with his length and he's going to be able to stretch the floor and hit shots. And so with New Orleans, you know, they've got a lot of young, you know, young pieces already in a, in a nice core. They need some glue guys. And so uh, with that pick, we've looked at guys that could fill a role. Uh, Moses Moody I and mean, Corey Kispert's a guy that we've looked at at that spot. Um, you know, Kispert, similar to Mitchell and Duarte, older guy. You know what you're getting. I mean, you know, is it a little high for these guys drafting in the lottery? I think there's an argument to be made on both both angles of it. Of hey, you know, are, is there is there star potential? Probably not. But you know, you're going to get a guy that's going to help you win games. And so it, it just depends on how, how you're looking at it. Um, but Moody, Moody, you know, checks the box as being a guy that could be a three and D. Yeah, and I would think, especially seeing what Mikael Bridges has developed into with Phoenix, you know. If you have the star power in place already, which you know New Orleans does with Zion and Ingram, like a, a guy like Moody, you don't necessarily need to develop into that number one option. Or you know, I know there's been rumors about New Orleans wanting to move off of ten uh, to dump Eric Bledsoe's contract. Uh, Bleacher Reports Jake Fisher, I think, reported today, I believe, um, that they've talked with Memphis about swapping ten and seventeen if Memphis takes Bledsoe and. You know, again, if Memphis moves up to 10 and gets Moses Moody, like I feel like all of draft Twitter already loves Memphis. If they get <laughs> if they pull off that move, I feel like everyone on draft Twitter is just going to adopt Memphis as their new team. Oh, sure. And I wonder if that's to try and get Giddy. Oh, interesting. You know, I, I've heard Memphis likes Giddy. I just I, I don't know if he'll be there. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, yeah. The, the drama. The drama is going to be thick uh, draft night. I think. <laughs> So are there any guys in this, you know, mid to late lottery range that you're nervous about based on where they're projected to go? Um, yeah, I think the, the one guy that, that I would say I'm nervous, I'm, I'm equally nervous and excited about is Kai Jones. I think he's a high risk, high reward guy. Uh, he's got all the tools. You know, he's 6'10", 6'11", long, athletic, shoots the ball, you know, rim protector, rim finisher. Um he just hasn't really put it all together yet. I mean, we haven't had a large sample size of him producing consistently. And so there's risk there. And so we have him at 11. Um, I mean, I, 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 when I say I'm, I'm nervous about him, um, you know, I, I would still take him there, you know? mm-hmm. but it's just, he, he's a, he's a swinging for the fences kind of prospect. Gotcha. 